Hello everyone. Today I'm going to do the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. I'll begin with the vertebral column. As you all know, there are 33 vertebrae. And if you look at them, you have 7 in the cervical region, 12 in the thoracic, 5 in the lumbar region, 5 sacral, and then 4 coccygeal. In between the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and then the first lumbar with the sacrum, you have the presence of intervertebral discs. And these form fibrocartilaginous joints. Now let's describe these vertebrae in detail. So if you look at a typical vertebra, it has a body anteriorly and the lamina posteriorly. So this is the lamina and the body. The two are connected by an area of bone which is known as the pedicle. So that part is the pedicle. On the pedicle, you have two little processes which stick up and then there are two processes placed inferiorly. These are called the superior articular processes. These are the inferior articular processes. On each process, you have a smooth surface which is called a facet. So there's a superior articular facet inferior articular facet. This is so that the vertebrae can articulate with one another this way. So you notice how they sit one on top of the other. Extending transversely from the pedicle and the lamina are these two processes which are known as the transverse processes. Posteriorly, the two laminae meet each other and extend backwards in a process which is known as the spinous process. And these spinous processes of all the vertebrae, you can feel on the back, on your back, this is what you're feeling. Those little points that you feel, these are the spinous processes. In the center of each vertebra, you have a foramen present, which is known as the spinal foramen or the vertebral foramen. And when vertebrae articulate with one another, the foramen are line up and then you get the vertebral canal or the spinal canal through which you can see inside, pass through this passes the spinal cord. So in this vertebral foramen, you have the spinal cord. Now the cervical, thoracic and lumbar vertebrae have some distinguishing features. The cervical vertebrae are distinguished by the fact that in addition to the vertebral foramen, they have two more foramen on either side which are known as the transverse foramen or foramen transversarium. And passing through this foramen transversarium is the vertebral artery, which you can see here. So you notice how the vertebral artery passes through this transverse foramen. You will also notice that the spinous process is more horizontal and the transverse processes are not single. In fact, because of the presence of the foramen transversarium, it's actually split into two parts. And that's why this is called the foramen transversarium, meaning it's a foramen in the transverse process. Now the cervical vertebrae, there are two cervical vertebrae which are special. 
The first one is known as the atlas vertebra. You can see it's ring shaped. It does not have a body. So you can see this vertebral foramen is so huge. It does not have a body. But otherwise it has all the other features. So it has the foramen transversarium. It has the superior articular facets, the inferior articular facets and the spinous process is very small. The second cervical vertebra is known as the axis. This is easily recognized because it has this protuberance which sticks out from the body. And this is known as the dense. It also has the transverse foramen, the vertebral foramen. And when it articulates with the first cervical vertebra, you notice that the dense comes to lie against this anterior bar of bone. And this is how the head rotates when you say no. When you go across like this, this is how it will rotate. So those are the cervical vertebrae. And their special feature was the foramen transversarium. The thoracic vertebrae, because they articulate with the ribs, their special feature is on the body, they have little facets which are known as costal facets for articulation with the rib. Thoracic vertebrae, the rib articulates like this with the body and the transverse process. So not only do you have these costal facets on the body, but you also have a smooth area on the transverse process for articulation with what is called the tubercle of the rib. This part here is the tubercle of the rib. So the presence of costal facets on the body and on the transverse process identifies a thoracic vertebra. The lumbar vertebra is identified more by exclusion. As you can see here, there is no foramen transversarium. If you look at the body, you will also notice there are no articular facets on the body or on the transverse process. So that tells you that this is a lumbar vertebra. So it, ne it doesn't have thoracic vertebrae features. So that tells you that this is a lumbar vertebra. While lumbar vertebrae are big, size is not a means of identifying a vertebra. Because if you're given just one vertebra, you don't know. You could have a very large thoracic vertebra. So you have to look for facets. And that will tell you that this is a lumbar vertebra if there are no facets present. You will also notice in a lumbar vertebra, the spinous process is rectangular. It's kind of like a quadrangle. It's not pointed like a thoracic vertebra. Notice how this is pointed. In a lumbar vertebra, it's more or less quadrangular. So you can see that that is different. The transverse processes are also very thin and very small. So that's another added feature of lumbar vertebrae. Let's now look at the sacrum and the coccyx together. And in the sacrum and coccyx, you have a surface of the sacrum which faces the pelvic cavity. So this is known as the pelvic surface. And this external surface at the back is called the dorsal surface. So here is the pelvic surface and this is the dorsal surface. Now in the sacrum, this part here is the body of the first sacral vertebra. These are what are known as the ala of the sacrum. This portion here is known as the promontory. You will notice on the pelvic and the dorsal surface where the sacral vertebrae have fused, you have little bars which separate them, telling you that that's the area where the bones have fused. You also notice four 
pairs of anterior sacral foramina in the pelvic surface and you'll see four pairs of dorsal sacral foramina on the dorsal surface. What you will also see on the side of the sacrum where it articulates with the hip bone up here on the side this is known as the auricular surface because it looks like a ear. On the dorsal surface in the midline you have a crest which is known as the median sacral crest and then laterally you have the lateral sacral crest. On the dorsal aspect the sacrum is incomplete so there's a gap present here and this gap is known as the sacral hiatus and this is often used to give caudal analgesia. The coccyx is a very small bone which consists of four fused vertebrae. So there are four bones and the articulation is called the sacrococcygeal joint. Now some important features about the pelvis that I would like you to note. note. So I'm going to remove this. Then we can look at the pelvis. We call it the bony pelvis when you have the two pelvic bones and the sacrum. Now there are certain sex differences between the male and the female sacrum. If you look up here at this point which is the subpubic, this is the pubic symphysis. Below the pubic symphysis there is an arch present. So this is known as the pubic arch or subpubic angle. In males, this subpubic angle is acute, it's narrow, so usually you can only put these two fingers. In females, it's obtuse, so much wider. A good way to check is if you put your fingers across like this and you notice that, you know, I can do this, so this is probably a male pelvis. These are plastic bones, so, you know, they don't necessarily always have the same features that a true bone would have. If it was a female pelvis, this would have been much wider. In females, what you also notice is these iliac fossae are much shallower and the reason is because these anterior superior iliac spines, they are wider apart. So they are much further apart, that's why women have a wider pelvis. In males, these two anterior superior iliac spines are much closer, so the iliac fossae are deeper. You will also see that the acetabula, are, these acetabular cavities are much closer in females, further apart in males, they are much smaller in females, the acetabular cavity much smaller in uh, females compared to males. Uh, what you'll also see is the obturator foramen is triangular in females and oval in males. These are not as important as the subpubic arch is perhaps the most important identifying feature which you should know because you can easily tell whether it is obtuse or acute. Smaller and larger are relative terms, deeper and shallower are again relative terms. So unless you have another pelvis to compare, you, are not able, you will not be able to tell whether it's deeper or shallower. Now let's go to the front of the body where we are going to be looking at the flat sternum and the sternum has three parts to it. This is the manubrium, the body of the sternum and the xephoid process. All three pieces are connected by a bit of fibrocartilage in between forming fibrocartilaginous joints. So this is the manubriosternal joint and this is the ziphi sternal joint. The manubrium articulates with the first costal cartilage and also the clavicle. The body of the sternum articulates with the second to the sixth costal cartilages on either side. 
and then the xiphoid process articulates with the seventh costal cartilage. So these are all the costal cartilages. This is a flat bone. It has a very thin layer of compact bone and then it has spongy bone on the inside. It is subcutaneous and because it is, has so much spongy bone, which means you have bone marrow present in it at all times, this is commonly used to do a bone marrow biopsy and it's easily accessible. Now let's look at a rib. So some ribs are atypical like the first, the second, 10th, 11th and 12th. This is the 12th rib. You can see how small it is. But what I would like you to know is a typical rib. So a typical rib articulates with two thoracic vertebrae posteriorly and then anteriorly by means of its costal cartilage it comes and articulates with the sternum. So it will come and articulate with the sternum. So anteriorly it articulates with the sternum, posteriorly with the thoracic vertebrae. The parts of the rib, this is the head of the rib, this is the neck of the rib, this part is the neck of the rib, this area here is the tubercle of the rib, and then this is the shaft of the rib. At its lower border you have a little groove present which is known as the costal groove. And this costal groove supports or it has present the intercostal nerves and blood vessels. So it protects them. So I think that completes the uh, sternum and the ribs. And then lastly, what I would like you to see is when vertebrae articulate with one another, so let's look at two vertebrae articulating with one another, any vertebrae you take. So let's just take the thoracic vertebrae. When they articulate with one another, I already mentioned you have a canal formed in between which is called the vertebral canal and that transmits the spinal cord. But on the side, when vertebrae articulate with one another, you have a little foramen which is formed up here, which is known as the intervertebral foramen. When they are not articulating, these are little notches which are present. So you have a superior articular notch and an inferior articular notch. So the superior of one and the inferior of the other, they when they get close to each other, you can see a foramen is formed. And because it's between two vertebrae, it's known as the intervertebral foramen. And passing through the intervertebral foramen are these spinal nerves, which come out from the spinal cord. And going in through these intervertebral foramen are blood vessels. So spinal nerves pass through the intervertebral foramen, whereas the spinal cord passes through the vertebral foramen. So you can see the spinal cord passing through the vertebral foramen. So that in short is the vertebral column, the sternum and the ribs. <laughs>